Yeah, I would thought after 15 years, like I was joking, I just walk in, you know, put my bag down. All right, everybody get your brush, make this stroke. Oh, get out of here, you gotta go paint so great, you know. But I think, you know, as well as you know, the more you the more you know something, the, or the more you do something, the more you realize how much you don't really know about it. And it just kind of opens up all these new avenues and all these new things. And I think one of the hardest parts for me is being able to disseminate super complicated information that I'm just now discovering and try to make it accessible to someone who's just now starting. We have Michael Nolan here, but if you go to his website, it's going to be what Michael John Nolan, yeah, right? Stick with John in. Yeah, and that's because you were, uh, there's too many other Michael Nolans. Right? I don't want to get confused with a professional football coach. Yeah. Or an ex professional football coach. I think he was one for the Niners, and there's an opera singer of Michael Nolan and <laughs> an Irish illustrator. So, yeah. Probably a serial killer somewhere in there. So, when we Google you, uh, what comes up under, uh, see, so do we, when we Google you, we should get Michael Nolan. MichaelJohnNolan.com, right? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, the website's MichaelJohnNolan.com, but I, I haven't Googled myself in a while. I used to for a while there just to see what would come up, but right. uh, I haven't done it in a few years, so I'm kind of nervous what's in there. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting about that. So I did this last week, and I hadn't probably done it in a couple of years, and it came up to some site that had snagged some of my videos oh, and no. things and was running, um, you know, gifts card things because yeah. we have so many we have high numbers on you know on youtube and things that yeah. they you know they snag one of the most you know looked at videos and then they were <laughs> they hijacked it so i was like oh great that's it's mildly flattering i guess but <laughs> <laughs> um no it's not it's, it's not, not at flattering all. It's at all it's, it's probably terrible. a bot did it and yeah. you know not even it didn't have anything to do with me at all they just yeah. said oh this one has a lot of views yeah. so i guess out there all those folks that are listening um it's, and it's probably a good idea if you're an artist actually to Google yourself periodically yes. to see what is going on yeah. because I was quite you know surprised to see that you know there was something that had nothing to do with what you know they snagged everything on it. Yeah, and don't just like go to the first page or second, but like sometimes the seventh page also there's this weird little thing in the back. You're like, what the heck is that? So, yeah, yeah. And so that I mean, and that's we'll get into it a little bit, but you know that's one of the things <clears throat> about being an artist. There's a lot of issues you have to deal with from a business standpoint that oh, right. I think people don't recognize. Yeah. And you know? school doesn't prepare you for a lot of that. No. I, I didn't mean to say that out loud. But. Yeah. <laughs> he teaches. Of course. <laughs> this is this is how we found out about you know Michael. He's teaching my son right now who loves your uh, as a as a teacher. He just was like raped. You gotta have him on oh, your podcast. That that means a lot. He, I mean like I said earlier, your son's wonderful to work with. So. Yeah. And so I uh, went and looked at the artwork course you have to do that it's important and it was really good fantastic actually thanks yeah it's really different interesting as like i wrote you you know it has there's an emotional charge to it no doubt oh. for me at least I, I i appreciate that that's what i was going for yeah so. no it's there yeah. yeah i could i could see having those in my house you'd be you have to get the right piece i have a list over here oh do you yeah. good you have the clown piece <laughs> yeah uh, sadly no that one sold a few years yeah ago, i bet so. that's i bet that sold immediately uh pretty much did yeah yeah it's a very cool piece thanks and again when you go to his website michael john I appreciate Nolan. It. <laughs> um so but where did you grow up michael uh born and raised here in tucson yeah. Arizona. No yeah. kidding. you're a product of our system i am a product of the system yeah um well, where did you go to school? Oh, uh, start at the beginning. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Uh, where did I go to school? I went to Whitmore Elementary, Townsend Middle School, which isn't there anymore. Sabino High School. Then I did my undergrad and grad at U of A. So you grow up in Tucson, and um, when did you first realize there was something about art that you were interested in? Oh, fairly early on. It was one of those deals where you know parents read comics to me, and all of a sudden I started drawing them, and uh, so you know probably three, four, five, somewhere in there. Yes. Yeah. And at somewhere between third grade, uh, say junior high, did you win any contests or get any? I was kind of quiet with all that stuff. Um, I got in trouble once with a teacher in fourth grade who thought I cheated and used a drawing from an older student when I did like a portrait of Edgar Allan Poe that my mother still keeps on like the refrigerator, <laughs> which uh -huh. is really charming. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't really enter any contests. I just kind of drew to myself. And then even in high school, I didn't really take that many art classes. It wasn't until college that I really explored. But when this fourth grade teacher, she thought... I think I think it was fourth grade. Yeah, she thought she you actually had cheated by getting somebody else's drawing. Right. Yeah. So they, they accused me of, of, of either tracing or, or using an older student's <laughs> drawing. And I felt great about it. And I was like, that's cool. So that's it. That's <laughs> yeah. the one. That was the moment. It I made like, you feel like, oh, I'm better than even uh, all the fourth graders. 
Oh, well, I, well, I wish I took it like that. I mean, yeah. I think I was just more hurt that she didn't believe me. <laughs> yeah. And But did that excel you at that time to keep drawing and doing those things, do you think? Uh, yeah. I mean, I always had kind of this underlying interest in it, whether I if I didn't, if I ever knew I was going to do it or not, I always kept coming back to it. So, um, you know, it's like everything with art. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, I don't think I enjoy it. I just kind of do it to mm. just get it out of me or to, yeah. it's, it's kind of part of me, but uh, mm. I always come back to it and note that I'm the most well-balanced human I am when I do it. So Yeah, it's, it's, that's interesting because people ask me about writing and they yeah. go, oh, you must love it. It must be so much fun. It's like, no. It's not fun, really. It's, <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> it's fun when you're done, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's there's for me there is enjoyment when I get things done, but it's usually hard work and yeah. Um, it, but I, I like how you put that. There's something you have to get out of you. It's it's bizarre. Um, you know, every now and again to go through some cold stretches or like some I guess they're always called blocks, but where you just maybe emotionally or physically exhausted by it. And then all of a sudden just kind of wells up and you have to start again and you just get that momentum going and yeah. wonder where it's always been, you yeah. know? So I can totally relate yeah, to that that's in, cool. in writing, you yeah. know? Yeah. And it, it seems to me, at least in writing, once you really get rolling, you don't want to stop. No. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to stop. And then all of a sudden you have to. <laughs> yeah. Something. Yeah. Something. Usually it's life. I think yeah. Usually it's life way. gets in the way. Yeah. yeah. And then you have to start it again. You got to start point. it again. Yeah. And so are you at that point right now? You know, I mean, that's kind of funny because I'm kind of getting over a, a, a probably a year mental block uh, where I wasn't making that many paintings, drawing a lot in the sketchbook, painting these little studies all the time. But I was, you know, maybe getting a little tired of the stuff I was painting. Uh, so kind of taking a bit of a transition, got a ton of new ideas, which is exciting about, but I don't know. A year doesn't seem that long in the grand scheme of things. We've been doing it for a while, mm -hmm. but you know, over the course of not making any artwork, it does look like. So it. you haven't made art in a year. Well, I haven't made a larger painting in about a year. Mm, that's you know, a long time. It is. I've done a lot of smaller paintings, a lot of studies. And what's small? Um, I don't know. A couple feet or under, somewhere in there. So, yeah. Yeah. I've been kind of known as the bigger painting guy for some of the galleries i've been showing at so. and bigger being 30 40 kind of thing yeah even bigger in that that size you know the couch paintings kind yeah, of stuff yeah, the, the, the ones that really <laughs> take it out of here like why did i do this this is 300 hours later and i'm yeah. not done with this yeah and i'm yeah. painting clown pores you know like. <laughs> <laughs> was that clown piece that big oh that clown piece yeah it was about uh, i think it was under five feet by five feet wow oh my god was yeah. that done just out of i want to do it or was there a reason to do that because um, it's an interesting subject matter to pick because people either hate clowns or love clowns. Yeah. And there's I, no in between. I'm, I'm kind of going on the hate clown part because sure. when I was painting it, I'd kind of close my studio door. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't know what kind of made me do that. It was a piece I had done uh, when I was in school. Uh, I just thought it'd be kind of funny because my friends and I were talking about it one day. And then, uh, but it was an illustration school and, you know, I, I wasn't very good back then. And, um, you know, I always wanted to revisit it later. And I'm like, well, I'm mildly better now. I'll revisit it. And at the time, it was just a small little painting. Right. And then I'm like, I'll do it five feet by five feet and I'll do this. And the mask was something simple. I just bought at Target and <laughs> thought, tried to make the creepiest thing I could have possibly uh -huh. done out of it. But uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, it has a look to it for sure. I guess we'll have to put that on your, on the, podcast for the, cool. That'd be yeah, neat. Yeah. The image. now just backing up a little bit. So do you, uh, what does your folks do? Oh, uh, both of them are retired mm -hmm. finally. So, they, uh, but what did they, do? Oh, uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, mother was in, uh, politics and so forth and then followed my dad around and, uh, they started a construction company together. Dad, you know, started off in rock and roll. And, uh, at least he says that a lot. We have no yeah. proof of it whatsoever, but he um, was in a band. Uh, yeah, uh, Mordecai Jones, and he played with Link Ray, and, uh, you know, he, he says he plays with Three Dog Night and uh -huh. uh, Neil Diamond and all that stuff, and we, we always sit there and we <laughs> nod when he tells those stories. You're not, you're not sure that's true? Well, I, I mean, there's only a few albums that, you know, he doesn't look the same like uh -huh. he used to. So. Did, did but, he make a living pl playing for a while? Uh, for a short period of time, yeah. Uh -huh. So it was his, uh, I think, late teens, early 20s. So, yeah. Yeah, that was cool. And so you... Clearly didn't want to go into music because of that. I tried, and <laughs> way to way to pick on me. I I tried to because he he he's an excellent drummer, an excellent drummer, yeah. and uh, so I try to pick up drums in school with a little practice pad and you know trying yeah. to hold a beat. And right. I think I lasted two months. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't do it. I was I was more spasming and cramping all my muscles to try to make uh -huh. a drum roll than anything else. But um, no, they uh, 
uh, worked construction for a long time in town, owned a few businesses. Uh, now dad is, uh, uh, you know, settled and writing novels too. So oh, very good. he's kind of surrounded by writers as well. Yeah. But uh, Has he published any yet? Yeah, quite a few, uh, five books. So. Oh, that's, no, he's really writing. Yeah, he's, it's cool stuff. What so. kind of stuff? We'll give a shout out to dad. Oh, uh, what is it? Action, adventure stories, kind of kind of a philosophical slant to them, which is neat. Have you read them yet? Oh, I've read all, yeah. Very yeah, good. Yeah, so um, I didn't read the last two for a few years and I, I kept getting nagged a little bit. Yeah. I'm glad I finally did. <laughs> They're, they're quite wonderful. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And um, did you know he had that in him? No. Um, actually, not even remotely close. You know, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of, I mean, I don't know, being a teacher, you you hear a bunch of stuff like, oh, this my, my you know, my friend's an artist. This is an artist. You tell people you're an artist. Oh, everyone's an artist. And look right. at what they've drawn. You're just right. like, oh, yeah, right. And right. Same thing with writers and musicians you know, and stuff. You're like, oh, well, I can't wait to read it or I can't wait to do that. I'm not trying to play them off, but... Um, and then you find out like, oh, well, dad's going to write books. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then you read it. You're like, why well, have you been writing the whole time? Like, why have you been, you know, hiding, you know? Yeah. Like, so they were profound. I couldn't believe it. So. And has he always, did he always want to do that? Oh, I don't know. Probably. You should ask him that question. I mean, yeah, we, we talked about a little bit. He was, uh, writing, you know, back in school and stuff like that. And I, I'm sure he wanted to write, but you know, like you said earlier, life kind of gets in the way. Yeah. And, I mean, five books, that's, a, that's, it is. He's, that's been, a he's been doing it, uh, you know, easily for the last uh, 10 years. Oh, well, yeah, no, that's, yeah, yeah, it it's takes, cool. it takes, it takes a while. Takes a while yeah. Yes, and, then, and then poor mom has to edit all of them. Yes. Yeah. So. All moms do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it signs up with the thing. Right. I, uh, yes, I will marry you. I do. And you have to edit the books <laughs> <laughs> multiple times. Yeah. They don't see that in the contract. It's uh, the fine print at the yeah, back. Yeah. Right? I think my wife knew that was going to be coming. But yeah. <laughs> um, so, and you have any brothers or sisters? I have two sisters, uh -huh. uh, both of them in town, and uh, one is a music teacher at the U of A, and the other one's a stay-at-home mom. Yeah, yeah, very cool. That's very cool. And so when you get through, when you go out of high school, or as you're going out of high school, did you think, I'm going to go into art? <sighs> I, I was trying to, and at the time, I had a little bit of a dis, you know, like kind of the self-perception that we all have, at least were groomed with early on with art was that you can't really make money at it right or you can't really do this it doesn't not a stable career that's kind of a yeah the, the, your dad and mom may have been saying the same oh right? they were they were very supportive but they were always like trying to make sure that you had a stable you know income to depend on and stuff like that and still trying to push both you know angles which i thought was very helpful but um i thought i, I mean i thought i wanted to go in engineering but i wasn't very good at math and so after about my first semester in the uh -huh. u of a of being undecided i was like ah right I think I'll go back to art, not knowing what I was going to do with it, you know. Uh, but you had all, that whole time in high school, you were still drawing and doing things. Yeah. Yeah. I was still pretty undecided, but I think always in the back of my mind, I knew I was going to be an artist. Were you doing cool. comics and things like that? Yeah, that's where I started. Yeah, yeah. I see that a lot. It seems to be a common theme. I yeah. Don't know why. It's, 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 at least for me, it was really accessible. Hmm. Uh, it was something I grew up with. It was kind of like, uh, you know, the printed idea of, of movies, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of mass entertainment, which I thought was very neat. Um, it was just a lot more accessible when you draw comics than like seeing a Da Vinci on a wall. I thought I've ever seen one, but seeing a Da Vinci on the wall and, and seeing like, oh, I'll start with this brush stroke. It was easier to break down, I think, a little bit, a little right. more accessible. But uh, I'm glad it led into painting. But yeah, I start off in comics. Yeah, because you're, I mean, your work is quite figurative for, most, for yeah, the most part, right? Yeah, that's basically where I stay. Yeah, is that what you would consider yourself a figurative painting? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's, I mean, I, I've, I like doing landscapes and still lifes and I think they're quite cool. And I, I see the absolute merit in them and, and, uh, the part where they build your skills and make you a hell of a lot better artist. It's just that for me personally, they don't, they don't keep my interest as long as the figure does the figure, mm. the figure I find almost impossible to paint. Yeah. You know, What's the hardest part of it? Um, not the abstraction of getting a likeness of somebody, if that's what you're going for, but like the idea of, I mean, it's going to sound I don't, interesting words, but trying to imbue their energy or personality into it. Not that I'm ever really successful in it, mm. but it's, you know, I mean, you could copy a photograph, you can copy, you know, uh, a reference photo, you can re draw somebody from this in from real life. And, um, you know, but the hardest part for me is to get kind of their intangibles into it, either through mark making or color mm -hmm. or... Because body that language. doesn't, yeah. Because that does, I was gonna say that doesn't necessarily mean you have to show the face, right? Right. It doesn't mean you have to you show know, the you face can, at all. You can show because I've looked at your things and some of them don't have a face or a body. I try not to. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think sometimes we're more descriptive without showing our face. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of our body language and how we carry ourselves. So I always have thought people who could really draw hands 
you know, had something yeah. that they had that, a skill set. I would agree with you on that because one. Because it's such a hard thing to do. It is. I call them five little portraits because ah. it, is, it is really difficult. Yeah. Uh, I always tease in all of my classes, you know, because I try to make it accessible, especially for the live drawing classes. But, uh, uh, you know, drawing hands is, is drawing five little portraits. It's extremely hard. Each yes. one has to have its own articulation, its own kind of life force. They all work together yes. in terms of the figures and stuff like that. So... Um, yeah, usually when artists get really good at drawing hands, they put them in everything, you know, like, ah, that's interesting. they'll, they'll yeah. put them on their logo, they'll put them on their website, they'll, you know, they'll always have them out, yeah, like kind of Egon Chile, they're just everywhere, yeah. you know, so. But I do, I look for that. Me too. You know, I, I use it actually as a parameter if, if they can really, I know, cause I know if they can really do a hand, they can probably do almost everything else. Yeah. I think, I think that's a wonderful idea for me too, because like, uh, feet are different, feet are weird, but yeah. hands definitely. <laughs> yeah. There's something about them that, uh. They're expressive. They're emotional. Yeah. Um, they're not symmetrical always. No. There's just things about them. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's, and yeah, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite features for checking out oil painters and oil paintings. <laughs> so yeah, you usually know you got a good one when you're like, oh, wait, that's the hand. Oh, yeah. That, nice. that, that, that actually doesn't look like a stump. Right. That's not five <laughs> sausages or like a, or a couple gherkins out there. Look yeah. at that. That's nice. <laughs> I was looking at a painting one time for a client who wanted to buy it at auction and he goes, Oh, it's just fantastic. It's, it doesn't it doesn't cost much for this artist. It was a burning house, um, a nice one. I said, it's great, except where's his foot? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? I go, go look at the stirrup. There's no foot. Oh, no. I, just a shadow or something, nothing. right? Nothing. Nothing. It's like he, maybe it wasn't a finished piece on that part or whatever, but <laughs> yeah. he was like, oh, God, I didn't see it. I go, yeah, you got to look at the whole thing. That's Yeah. It's, it doesn't have a foot. Yeah, artists, the good artists, when are really good at hiding what they don't know what to do, right? Like all of a sudden, like in some of Frank Fazetta's early work, you see like all of a sudden like a panther over the feet, and you're like, wait, he doesn't know how to draw feet. <laughs> like there's always a panther or a log or a smoke yeah, screen. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, you know, we do our best to cover up. I think that's why I use so much black in my paintings. It's like I don't know what to do with backgrounds. I'll just cover them up. You know? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so you go into to college doing comics yeah. and say, okay, I'm going to go into art. So what do you you get a BFA and yeah, you know? I got a BFA in illustration. Uh, and that's at the University that's of Arizona, That's at the University of Arizona, right? yeah. And uh, at the time, I didn't even know what illustration meant. I was just thinking, okay, I need to get a job. I need to make sure I have uh, some kind of skill set that a commercial, uh, you know, a private enterprise could use, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, media or whatever. So I, I kind of stuck to the more of the commercial arts, the design and illustration classes. And that's kind of where I, I found a good mentor. And that's where I kind of found my niche. But Yeah, who was the mentor? Uh, David Christiana at the U of A. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's still there, thank God. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, wonderful man, wonderful person. Glad to call him a friend now. But he was one of the first people that really said a few key things and showed you a few key things that just really clicked. And you're like, oh. I yeah, like what? Um, I, I probably didn't pay attention in school very well. <laughs> I like to always blame myself for that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, just the idea of like really basic color theory, you know, seeing color as temperature, something that, you know, I try to give to my students immediately, but something I never really had. So mm. I didn't really understand, especially, of course, I didn't take that many painting class. I was usually taking drawing class. So about to my junior year, I didn't really know how to mix color. I didn't really understand how to neutralize color. I was just kind of like putting colors on a tube and hope that it landed somewhere. Mm -hmm. And once Dave kind of described color as warm and cool, just everything just clicked. And mm. then I, I could see color. I could see temperatures. I could see relationships. I understood how to neutralize. And a lot of stuff that I was struggling with kind of, you know, started to put itself together. So. And did he talk about Joseph Albers color theory and that uh, kind of stuff? He had mentioned Joseph Albers and yeah. I subscribed to the Joseph Albers color theory quite a lot and reference him quite often in my classes. But he was more uh, kind of referencing, which is still the same kind of concepts, the Brandywine tradition. He was always showing the N.C. Wyatts and Maxfield Parishes, and mm. you know, uh, always showing the Lucian Freuds and Jenny Savilles in terms of how they knew neutralized color, neutralized color mainly just for flesh. Because I, I got a, a hold of him when he was teaching his uh, figurative painting classes mm -hmm. and figure drawing classes, and I think that's when the spark really kind of took hold. And when you get a, a a really good teacher like that who inspires you. Do you think that set you on your own path for yeah. figurative drawing yeah. or painting, I should say? I don't want to ever tell David that. I don't yeah. want to make his head too big, but <laughs> I, I mentioned it to him, yeah. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do with art. All I know is that I needed to have art in my life. And then I think very unconsciously working with him put me on the path to be a teacher. Um, you know, my mother had also been a substitute teacher. Her mother had been a teacher. 
Um, my sister Karen is a teacher. At yeah, the U of she's, a. she's a music teacher. She's a music is she teacher. She older than you? Uh, yeah. She is very much mentally older than me, yeah, but okay. uh, she's two years Karen. younger. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but uh, coming kind of coming from a family of teachers, I thought I wasn't going to be a teacher because I hated school in a way because I hated being told what to do and uh -huh. like have this. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I love authority, but I, I I hate being told what to do. But I kind of subjectively crave it in a way. But. Uh, it's so funny that now I tell people what to do for a living. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love to tell people what to do for a living. And was Moira or Joffrey on? Was she there then? Yeah, yeah. Moira was there. Um, I didn't take a class with Moira. I wanted to. When I took a figure sculpture class that she was supposed to teach, um, she was on sabbatical at the time, so I got a great teacher named Sue Johnson to teach yeah. that class. And that's not, that was another class kind of uh, tangently that turned me on and actually taught me how to draw, which I didn't really expect. Because I take you take all these drawing classes, but mm -hmm. you don't really... At least for me, I didn't really get the idea of how to create that three-dimensional illusion until I actually started to sculpt and build with it. Because mm -hmm. once you start to get your hands in the round and start to understand, oh, you know, what, you know, this is what form really is. Right. This is what light is. This right. is how, this, how to construct it. It seems so simple to think about, but until you actually do it, all of a sudden my drawings took off afterwards. From sculpture. From sculpture, yes. yes. That makes sense. Yeah. So I always try mm -hmm. to recommend to my students, you know, like, I mean, because I was in the same mindset too, and I'm not too f far removed from where they, you know, from uh, from being their point, you know. So I try to say the same things that would have helped me, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, take that sculpture class, take that printmaking class, take that painting class, get outside your comfort zone because you never know what will be that one class or that one teacher that will spark that one. And it's a building block. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And so when did you graduate from the U of A? Oh, I uh, graduated my BFA undergrad in 2002, and then I went right into un went right, right into graduate school and that was for a master's that was for a master's yeah and why the masters um deep down i was not confident in my work and confident that i had learned enough mm -hmm. and then also uh objectively i thought teaching at that time would be a really nice which is what most people say, like kind of a fallback, right? right. Like if I'm not dominant in the world with my painting, I'll, I could fall back on right. this, you know. But uh, um, and then when I got into graduate school, then I started to understand how working with David and a few others, like Alfred Kuros and stuff like that, when I was with you, they kind of they got into my head, mm. and I was like, I can really love this. And and at any point at that time, did you go, hmm, maybe I should really just give it a shot as a painter and not be a um, yeah, I mean, I thought I could uh, selfishly do both a little bit, and that's that's kind of a tough thing to do, uh, just because there's only so much time in the day. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I, I try to do both. I, I think I go through spurts where I can focus on, you know, creating the best class, and I'm like, all right, two months later, I'll focus on creating the best painting. But it's mm -hmm. it's hard for me to do both at the same time. Because um, you have galleries that represent you. Yeah, I've got a couple of them, but I I try to put so much, you know. I, I can't do anything. I can't do anything half half booty, right? Mm -hmm. Half half. So I have to. I have to put everything in, which I think which why it exhausts me because like <laughs> I'll be painting and you know for a couple months straight or three months straight, and all of a sudden I'll be done with a couple paintings. I'm I'll sit on the couch for two weeks, you know, because like I, <laughs> I need to recharge somehow or something. Yeah. Uh, so you when you get your uh, MFA, right? Yeah. Um, then what did you do? Oh, um, well, I got really lucky. Uh, because uh, the, I didn't piss off all my teachers when I was there, uh -huh. not listening to them and not turning in their work on time. So they were very gracious at the U of A to hire me as an adjunct uh, the year after I, the, you know, the, the semester after I graduated. So I would teach one or two classes at the U of A. Um, I went and uh, applied at Pima College and got one or two classes there. You know, and at the time, I started to sneak a little bit into the illustration world, um, and again, kind of by accident, you know, connections and, and friends. Um, I've always been the worst salesman for my artwork, so I'm always just you like, are an artist. I know. I'm just like I'm not good enough. I don't want to do this. Yeah. Oh, I just it's hard. Want, it know, is hard to do that. It is. It's, it's hard to talk people on the phone. Yeah, because, it is. You know, but uh, uh, anyway, so a friend of mine was in uh, the Tucson Roller Derby, and they liked my drawings and asked me to do a poster and so i did uh, one of the, re the regional bouts or local bouts then i did a regional bout then i did a national bout poster uh -huh. and then you know and did you go and paint on site to get or draw no get? but that'd be really cool yeah. so that's um, yeah because again like you said with sculpting and everything oh, right. else i mean i think it that performance aspect yeah, that would be it gives really you the neat. sweat yeah. the smell the yeah. whatever <laughs> the things you can't no sadly i didn't get into that kind of uh 
because that was a neat thing in the 2000s where, you know, they were getting artists, musicians, and doing this whole kind of performance right. thing, getting artists up on stage, either sculpt or paint while the you know, musicians played it. It, yeah. it was pretty cool, but no, <laughs> I was excluded. They didn't, they didn't want to play. So. <laughs> so you worked for the U of A for a little bit. A little and, bit, yeah. And then when did you get your job in, in Pima? Well, um, the U of A led um, to work at a local art school in town, private art school, the South Coast University of Visual Arts. Uh-huh. Um, which at the time was called the Art Center. Okay. And, and so, it yeah, it was, uh, I, I applied there because another buddy of mine from graduate school, um, you know, said, we need a painting teacher. Would you mm-hmm. like to do this? I sadly didn't know they were in town. Yeah. You know, my, my narrow f- focus is extremely limited. Um, <laughs> and so I went down there and interviewed and got and got a couple jobs there. And, and that led to me, you know, kind of running their painting and drawing department for about four years, which was really cool. Is, that's gone, that... Place. No, it's still there. Is they just they just kind you? of they just kind of rebranded. So they yeah. went from the Art Center Design College and they 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 turned into Southwest Southwest University of Visual Arts. Okay. And uh, Suva. So um, I I was pretty naive, you know, because I mean, twenty six. You know, most twenty six year old men in the thirties are like you know started families, like probably built a bridge, you know, yeah. and like huh. lived three lives. Me coming out of school was like like my third day on the planet. Yeah. So I, I felt like a seventeen year old, like right out of school. So um Yeah, what's that like when you go from so all of a sudden you're a student, you're you know, okay, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're the teacher. It it's bizarre. That's why I grew out this terrible beard so I could at least <laughs> to look older. To look a little bit older and not have such a baby face. The balding helped. Yeah, I'm I was going to say it helped I wasn't a lot. Mention no, that, no, it's fine. That was good that you did it, that. It was as nice. Well. I, I'm, most people don't want a bald. I was encouraging. I'm like, Come on, one more hair. Get <laughs> yeah, out. I look old. I look like I'm forty. Um, but yeah, what's that like? I mean, because now you're the expert. It's intimidating, yeah. and actually. Um, I relished it and also was completely terrified of it because what you just said, uh, and I took it very seriously um, because I didn't know everything. And so I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to be a teacher is because I wanted to be a professional student mm. and I just wanted to learn all the time and, and and take the classes and eventually they kick you out of school, which mm-hmm. is nice. Um, and I think the next best thing, and probably a lot of teachers say this, is that you go to graduate school and you become a teacher. You know, so you can basically stay learning the whole time. And and that forced me, that kind of fear to not know, forced me to learn everything I possibly could. Yeah. And because um, part of the thing that I know I got from a few great teachers when I was in school that really still inspired me is that question of, okay, this is this is how this is this is how it works, right? Here's color in this, but how does it really work? Why do we use this? You know, those those deeper questions like, okay, here's here's a traditional color scheme. Here's a complement color scheme. Cool. How does that work in nature? Why does that work in nature? When do I use that? Why would I use that? What am I trying to emote and communicate if I do use that? Those are the questions I'm like, that was the kind of questions I would ask in school. Yeah, more deep, more granular deep, questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, create presence and mood. Why do I use these things? Not just when and how. Like, And so those are the things I didn't have answers for. And so I just, Do you know? I try, <laughs> at least I'm say them better with yeah. more confidence, yeah. but, um, no, because it's ever expanding, it yeah. always changes and stuff. But that was the kind of stuff that made me search really hard or this painting technique or this, or even more technical stuff. When do you use this varnish or that? I didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. And so I just, you know, bless the internet being out at the time, you know, you could just type into Google and, you know, get a ton of sites, that, like we were talking about earlier, a ton of sites that are terrible, but a lot that are that leads you onto the next key and next key. Then you learn about, oh, there's the, you know, the 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 seven the the Flemish method of painting, which leads you to this and this underpainting and this, and all of a sudden you're 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 using rabbit skin glue and yeah. you know, you know you're, all of a sudden you're so far. Now, have you use rabbit skin glue? I have and I do use oh it in my, my garage. Yeah. Smells like feet occasionally. Yeah, so I, I and so is this like two oh four when you're starting when you're teaching? Um, I started teaching in graduate school, uh, yeah, when I was 24, so it was 204. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and then, um, oh, I feel so bad for those kids that had me the first time around. I know I tried. Yeah. Uh, I think half the class was older than me. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And you can learn from students, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would assume that there would be things that they would see differently or ways that they approach yeah. the art that you go, hmm, I haven't even thought about that. No, that, I mean, that's, that's a really good point, and I... As much as I love to pretend that I'm like this great master and that I know everything and you should all listen to me. I, I made that rubric. You should pay right. attention to that. Right. You didn't read your handout? How dare you? Um, uh, deep down, I'm, I'm scared out of my mind that I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> and that I'm going to fail and that I 
don't, you know, basically don't know what's going on. So that interaction and the pulse and the discourse with the students, I think is immeasurable. And it, you know, it sounds silly, but every semester I come out of dealing with, because every class is different too. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously every student's different. Every class is different. You can't handle every situation the same way. And I've had interactions with students and overall classes to where I've changed not just lectures, but kind of curriculum. Mm. immediately like this is what worked better this is what they you know and i saw things a little bit differently because so, you saw them succeed in a i different saw way. them succeed in a different way i saw one thing spark and open them where it didn't before you know i mean it's it's an ever-changing construct that is awesome and exhausting you know because yeah. it's just like i'd love to just come into class and just all right i got my slideshow just click all right i'm out go right. home put on my sunglasses you know paint <laughs> uh -huh. kind of stuff but you know i'm after every lecture i'm i'm you know after everybody leaves I, you know, I'm at the computer refine tuning the stuff that I just, oh, that didn't work here. That was a great question over here. I'll add this kind of over here. Yeah, that shows you're a good teacher. I try. Yeah, and you're, it's, you're it's, taking in information and you're trying to uh, make it better. Yeah, and it's just out of failure. You know, I don't yeah. want to fail. So. Yeah, nobody wants to <laughs> nobody fail. Wants to, I mean, nobody wants to, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to. <laughs> and so you, um, you start in 204, you go to all these different places and you're teaching. And what kind of classes are you teaching? Are you teaching... Draw, drawing, color composition, painting, those kind of things? Basically that kind of foundation of classes. Yeah, at the U of A, I was teaching some more uh, commercial stuff with you know uh, some illustration, comic book classes, sequential illustration. Uh, I got you know uh, very lucky to be able to teach kind of their upper division figurative classes, which mm. were nice. Um, at Pima, it was kind of uh, their, you know, just getting my foot in the door. So it was their basic design classes, their foundation design. You know, I even got snuck into some art history classes. Mm. That'll wake you up. Is like, that David teaches that course? Uh, David was teaching in the illustration department. So he would teach the higher up illustration classes. And, and then when he went on sabbatical, I got to teach his figurative classes, which I thought was cool. Mm. And I, I'd, I'd write him notes. I'd go back on sabbatical. You know, yeah. like they, they love you, but I love teaching <laughs> these classes. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and then at, at Suva, and, and, and bless their hearts, either I was a great con man at the time, or they really did trust me. And I like to think it's a little bit of both. But, you know, they gave me the opportunity to teach a lot of classes. Mm. And because they gave me that opportunity, I wanted to work really hard for them and make sure that everything went all right. So I taught, and when I interviewed at Pima, they didn't believe me. Because they said, it says here on your, your resume that you've taught 27 different classes at mm. Suva. Now, this is 27 total, and I said, no, 27 different classes, because Suva was great. Every every class they'd offer me, I'd say yes. Uh -huh. You know, I, I was like, I should probably say no to some of them. American history, I said no, because yeah. I was like, uh -huh. I, I, I can't. You should have said yes. I should have said yes. You probably would have learned a lot from that. Actually. I probably, I really could have, but... Uh, well, I, here's the funny thing about that. American history is really important to painting, yeah. and the reason it is, is because... All those things that have happened in the world affected those artists when they were painting. Yeah. Whether it's World War One, World War Two, pandemic flu, all those things right. really put pressure on the artists and it gives them the emotional bent. I think you do actually, and I can see why they teach it, get the sense of what formed and focused that person, yeah. whether they wanted it to or not, through, you know, their own environment. No, that's an excellent point. Yeah. I mean, knowing the context, knowing the history as best we can. I mean, I mean, we don't even know the history of what's going on right now. And it's, it's, you know, as we're living through it, reading a book and reading one person's perspective or seeing one documentary, it just gives us such a narrow focus on what that period of time was oh, like. Yeah. So it's hard to always put ourselves in the context, but really good to do that. I agree hundred percent. So you have to take, you have to teach that class. Yeah. Now. I mean, I, <laughs> I would have probably loved to teach it. And, uh, but I think at the time, you know, I don't think <laughs> I didn't have the confidence myself to be a history teacher at that point. Yeah, so I'm sure that was, it was what it way was. out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, but they were great at Suva, and they, they allowed me an opportunity to teach a lot of different classes and really succeed in their system. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to get the Pima job without it, mm. you know. So which was nice because sounds I, like it's kind of almost that was a coveted job for you. It was, yeah. And I just kind of stumbled into it. And why is that? Why would that? Why is that a coveted job to be in Pima? The Pima, yeah. um, the the coveted job is too because I've always wanted to work. When I when I first figured out I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to work at either Pima or U of A. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work at one of the higher echelon of 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 teaching art, uh, you know, especially locally, and. The reason, especially locally, is because I'm such a family boy. That, I mean, grew up here. My whole family's here. I wish I didn't like them that much because yeah. I would be, all right, cool. 
I'll get out of here immediately and just run away. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, no, I, I sadly like those those jokers. Well, so. and Tucson will do that to and you. And Tucson will do that to you. Yeah. So I've, uh, it wasn't just a deal of being comfortable here. It was a deal where it was just like, okay, do I get up and leave and move the, across the whole country for something that's unknown could be really great, you know, for the same amount of money, be by my parents and by my family and by my sisters and, you know, and just because, I mean, we grew up very tight as a family. Mm. And so that was one of the main reasons I wanted to stay. Yeah. yeah. So, and now how long you've been teaching at Pima? Uh, just finishing up my eighth year. Oh, that's a long time. It is. It goes by very quickly. Yeah. You've done this 15 years now as a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think you've gotten to that point now where you're a good teacher? I hope so. Yeah. Um, my son uh, definitely thinks. I, I'm glad. I'm glad <laughs> that that dollar he's, a day. And he's I was quite critical. If okay, you're, good. If you're not, good. I, I can well, assure that, you. That's a ringing endorsement. <laughs> um, I really try, and I'm not just trying to play the humble card. I mean, I know I'm, you know, I know I'm a good teacher, but I I want to be a really good teacher. So, at the end of the semester, I'm always like really critical of every class of what I did wrong or what I could do better, and not like to the point that it's browbeat. I'm just pointing like, okay, I could do this or I could add this and you know, fix this. I'm always constantly re retuning and finding classes. And to what your earlier point was is, yeah, I would thought after 15 years, like I was joking, I could just walk in, you know, put my right. bag down. All right, everybody get your brush, make this stroke. Oh, get out of here. You got no pain. So great. You know, <laughs> but I think, you know, as well as you know, the more you, the more you know something, the, or the more you do something, the more you realize how much you don't really know about it. And yeah. it just kind of opens up all these new avenues and all these new things. And I think one of the hardest parts for me is being able to disseminate super complicated information that I'm just now discovering and try to make it accessible to someone who's just now starting. Right. You know, and uh, when to give them that information, when to hold it, when to put that roadblock in front of them that they need to overcome, when to get the roadblock out of their way and give them the push through. I mean, that's the stuff that I, I still struggle with to a point, you know, like, but I, I really search for it and try. And so when you have a general painting class, so let's some, somebody who's out there goes, I want to, regardless of age, yeah. they want to take a painting. Um, and some are going to be at horrible levels and others will be at very good levels. Yeah. How do you equally treat people in a class like that and encourage them, especially if you see somebody who has maybe enthusiasm, but no skill set? Right. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, the, I mean, you try to hold the class to an overall standard and you try to have this objective idea of what the standard is to being like an intro to painting class or a, an intro to design class or a drawing, you know, advanced drawing class and try to hold them to that standard while secretly getting the ones that can go beyond further and beyond and then getting the ones that don't feel that they're secure up to that point. Um, it's a lot of individual um, kind of assessment and scanning. Um, some people I'm very encouraging to the point that it's a fault mm. and they think that I'm just being silly and they don't listen to me. And I'm like, you know, just, you know, making jokes. And all of a sudden I keep encouraging to the point that they actually do realize along with people who've been doing it for a while, it's just hard work. Mm. You know, if, if you, I mean, if you work hard, regardless, if you don't have, a, you know, it's a kind of idea of that natural skill, which I think is kind of a misnomer to a point, but you know, I think everybody can paint and draw to a certain point. Absolutely. And so most of it is just getting past the wizardry of hard work, you know, and getting them over that discouragement and figuring out, you know, no, oh, I can't do this and can't do this. It's a lot of personal stories. It's a lot of uh, relating to them and showing them what I went through. It's a lot of showing uh, and exampling of, of how to build the images, like specifically if it's a painting, okay, we don't know where to start. This is how you start and giving them a process of rote memory that they can continue to do. And then once they get into the process enough time, then they can start to realize what they, they do and do not have. So it's, it's just kind of a system of uh, individual encouragement or some students need, you know, a little bit of tough love, you know, then you can get that kind of response out of them too. And does the tough love come when they're really just not putting in the effort? Yeah. Yeah. Some, and it, it depends. Some students, you know, either don't put in that effort because they, they're not encouraged or some of the students don't put in the effort because they just need to kind of kick in the butt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the hard part of being a, a good teacher is knowing when that is, mm. uh, because you don't, you don't want to get them confused. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's some yeah. kids that go, Oh, painting, I'll just take this. It'll be easy. Right. But to kind of get back to your point, um, it's, it's being as objective as you can, uh, but still grading the person to the overall level of the class, but 
also into their individual achievement of what mm. they can do within their own selves and how they can push themselves. So it's it's an interesting kind of dynamic, um, you know, to get that across and uh, one that keeps me, uh, you know, loving teaching. I mean, I, I love that kind of stuff because... Well, you can make a huge difference positively or negatively, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, a teacher can destroy somebody too if they just say, oh, you don't have the ability oh, I know. to go find a new home. Yes, very much. I mean, I didn't realize, I mean, that's a funny point you brought that up because I didn't realize till about, I don't know, like year three or four when I was teaching, when I got out of the U, that every single word you say yep. means something. And you never know what that word is that will that will get that one person to either be, like you mentioned, inspired or devastated. Yep. And I had one student who wrote me, a uh, very nice guy, we're still friends today, that he, based on what I said, just at, I mean, when, he, when he finally graduated, he's like, all right, I'm going to do what Michael said. I'm going to get up, leave town. I'm going to go to the coast. I'm going to get myself my animation job, and I'm going to start there. I don't even remember saying that to mm -hmm. him. Like, that was like, oh, no, I didn't remember saying that. <laughs> and he wrote me this email, and he was, it's, he was very uh, happy he did so, and all this information, advice that I gave him. And I was saying, like, but I didn't, did I say that uh -huh. stuff? <laughs> like, uh -huh. So I, I try to be as, as, as cautious as I am, but, uh, you know, as forward as I can be. So, uh, yeah, no, it's important. Well, it I mean, that fourth grade teacher still sticks with you. Yeah, I guess so, huh? Right? Yeah. It's funny how it works, isn't it? You never know what that one thing will be. Yeah, and I think art is so emotionally um, close to you yeah. that um, you have to be vulnerable. Right. And if you want, and you, and when you put that vulnerability out to the world to see, especially just who they look at as, you know, being a, uh, somebody who knows what they're doing. And if you get struck down and, and, you know, that's just like, mm, it is, it's really it's, destroy it. It's really tough. Um, I've heard art school, in fact, or not, maybe not art school, but going to the university and getting a BFA sometimes can, for some artists, it doesn't work out well because, the program can really actually destroy what they have innately. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that or many times. Yeah. Yeah. I've I heard mean, that from many artists, by the way. Yeah, I have too. Um, and it's an interesting kind of dilemma. Uh, you know, I, I had uh, people I used to work with that uh, went to very fancy art schools in San Francisco that gave them so much work that they'd completely overworked them and burned out. And, you know, some of those people just ran out of the room screaming and stuff. Um, you know, I had a friend at the U of A who was a very talented a drawer and he went into computer sciences and he decided to get an art major and he took a or art minor pardon me and he went to go take a couple of the art classes ran into a conflict with a few of the more interesting teachers that with the u of a at the time and ran out the door screaming he, had, he doesn't really draw since then so mm -hmm. it's a it's something that i i i try to take on the challenge all the time I try to want to find out first and foremost from that person who's coming because being at the community college is awesome and I like it a lot, you know, because I, I always wanted to see myself, you know, deep down and don't tell Pima this. I was like, as a kid, I'm like, oh, U of A is top. You know, you get you get stuck in kind of a, right. a local regional landscape right. kind of thing. But I am really blessed I landed at Pima because dealing with all the different people you get at the community. Like if I teach a life drawing class and just now with the painting class with your son, I mean, look at the people you run into. But also I'm getting professionals in that class who could paint me under the table. Mm. I'm getting people who have never picked up a paintbrush. I'm getting teachers who want to have a class. I'm getting students that are going to transfer into the arts. I'm having students that are going to go into marketing and so forth and just want to use this as a relaxing time. You get the entire scope. Mm -hmm. And then you get the person who's trying to use this class as kind of their identity builder. Like maybe they had a rough time and they're picking themselves back up and they want to use it as a point that gives them that encouragement that tells them they, they can achieve what they want to achieve. Yeah. You know? So... It's a very daunting task. So in the beginning of every semester, I try to figure out very personally why everybody wants to take the class, what they want to get out of it, get to know them, you know, find out artists that they like, encourage this. And just through just general conversation and being the pulse of them in the room, you know, you get a sense of who they are, what they want, what they want out of this class, and a lot of, of kind of intangibles that we all try to hide from teachers, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that when I was a student, you know, I think, ah, oh, I can tell, this teacher will believe anything I'm saying. Right. They, don't, they don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And, 
And all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, my teachers knew everything that I was doing, yeah. everything I was even thinking if they were tuned in. You know? So it's <laughs> kind of an alarming feature. I didn't realize kind of coming into teaching this way. <laughs> yeah. And so how many people will be in a typical painting class like that? Um, Pima's got pretty good class sizes. Uh, even when I was at U of A and, uh, and uh, Suva, it's all about around the same. You want to keep it to about 20 or 15, yeah. somewhere in there. Because it gets too big. I mean, yeah. you need a huge facility, and then also it's hard to keep everybody, um, you know, keep everybody's attention and and and, and guiding them kind of. And so, when you're doing, um, when you're telling people what you know, oh, do this or do that, or here's some options. What are the options for somebody to go to art school versus, say, go to just get a B, to get a BFA? Yeah, um, that's kind of a loaded subject. Yeah, um, I'm sure, but. We have uh, a lot of artists and people that are interested in art to listen right. to this. And I'm, you know, I'm curious about that because, you know, I have my, my gallery has artists that have never gone to art school. Yeah. People that have gone to great art school. Some have gotten BFAs, the, you know, there's a whole gamut. Yeah. And, you know, if they're in here, they're clearly good enough. It doesn't matter. Whatever yeah. that choice is, they made it. Right. But these are decisions that, you know, people have to make. So, yeah, I yeah. think before, um, I'll call it the great tuition increase for the last 10 years, <laughs> yeah. it was a lot easier to make those decisions, you know, uh, where people like myself were just like, okay, well, I'll just, this is kind of the progression that seems logical that I've been encouraged to take, and I'll just keep going through this progression. Um, but the first question they should ask themselves is, what do they want to do? Um, and if they have kind of a really I, good idea of what they, then they can start to narrow focus a few schools that might lead into those careers. Because some careers in terms of and we'll kind of do kind of a broad swath, like some careers in terms of the animation fields or so forth, like, you know, USC and their film department, right? So like they they pull out a bunch of filmmakers. UCLA has right. got a great reputation for animation and animation animators, you know. Um, they, I think at least I'd like to pull from Pixar and stuff like that. So it's, it's a fascinating thing of knowing what you might want to go into. Um, in terms of just kind of general, most, I mean, kind of, kind of dancing all over the place, some of my favorite artists said thank god they never went to art school like a francis bacon or something right. like that and um the ones that can make it really well before the internet that did not go have to go to art school were the ones just were very good at self-leveraging and i think that's one of the things a lot of people have to ask themselves can you self-leverage can you sit down in front of that easel and try to discover what you don't know that takes you eight to ten hours of just searching experimenting playing mm. failure after failure mm -hmm. after failure and if you can do that and say you don't want to, uh, you don't want to teach, uh, uh, you know, and you don't want to go to a certain commercial field, then I, oof, this is going to sound weird. I probably wouldn't recommend, you know, going to a, a specified art school and then dropping eighty grand in debt right. and then trying to get a job after that. You know, so that's a rare person I would think that yeah. could actually sit in front of that. That's a rare and person, that. and but then kind of the next stage is you know, kind of the community college level. So mm -hmm. you don't know where to start, take some community college level classes or like a, you know, a, a local place like the drawing studio or something like that to figure out a foundation, get in contact with people, figure out if you do like it, if you're, if it's part of how you can see your life and so forth. And then that can kind of lead to other things. But, um, you know, it, it, to me, it is all kind of with the searching and playing to figuring out what you want to do and how you want to do it will kind of lead ultimately to it. But I didn't mean to rhyme there. Um, also, I'm turning a Dr. Seuss. But it's because of, I try to encourage my students to not get in tremendous debt. You know, I know it sounds, you know, terrible to say. No. Working at an institution, but we have to be very realistic about it. You know, like, um, if somebody wants to go to, you know, the uh, Art Institute of Chicago, and they know it's going to lead to a certain job, and they're going to get in hundred and eighty thousand dollars worth of debt and they know they can pay it off by doing this it's a very pragmatic approach and that only school will provide those only connections to do it and you'll probably get a wonderful education there but um to me it's i'm be i think i'm becoming a little bit too practical to, <laughs> to think about it that way the most important well, it, part is but that is true yeah the most important part is just to um get your foundation you know i recommend a local community college or, or think about you know there's a ton of resource on the internet but the hard part we were mentioning earlier is which ones are good which ones are which ones are rough uh, being a little bit honest here um you know and how to end up choosing those kind of things so 
I know it's kind of a long-winded answer to your very nice question. So yeah, but yeah. the bottom line is try try to do some self-searching for yourself too, yeah. right? Yeah. And some... what do you really want out of art? Yeah. And an art career. And if it turns out that it, it just wants to, you know, you're just like, oh, well, it needs to be a hobby, and I'll just do it this, or you turn out like I have misjudged everything about my life, and I need to be an artist. Right. Then you'll know, and you'll have the passion to get things done. Having a good foundation, you know, either that is a little bit more cheaper to get either a local community college or, or, or at, uh, you know, something like the drawing studio or a good internet, you know, online program lets you know what the other programs can offer and if it's, if you're willing to pay that price to get that kind of stuff. But I always recommend all students to try to get or all people going into it have some kind of technical background to fall back on, um, you know, have some kind of maybe I, I went the commercial route too you know, mm -hmm. teaching background, have some kind of, you know, because a good artist to a point, you know, um, has usually three or four occupations, right? You know, so. Well, I think it depends on, you know, in my gallery, maybe only two or three people have other jobs that they do besides oh, just good. painting yeah. full time. Um, and those are, of course, all art related. Yeah, their, that's well, what I was referring to, yeah. art related. Like, yeah, you know. they do something like you do, you yeah. know, they're, they're art teacher you know, at a university yeah. or a head of some, you know, illustration department. But, and even those individuals that do that, one does it because they like interacting with students. And yeah. I think they get the same thing you do. They learn from them. They see stuff. It keeps them uh, vibrant. It keeps them uh, in touch with, um, with that side of them. And then the other person does it because of healthcare. Yeah. They want to keep the healthcare, uh, you know, they could, they could, sell every piece that they wanted right um but they have a big family and they're yeah. afraid that you know they'll be toast when the healthcare. and i can't yeah, there's I nothing can. i can say to do you know right as a dealer i want to go yeah i know you can well you'll be very successful right. you already are but i also understand that other kind right. of thing so no it makes perfect sense yeah he's doing his thing and he's going to probably continue to do that and, <laughs> which is we don't get enough paintings and we sell every one of them yeah <laughs> and you know who you are out there david uh -oh him called out <laughs> he's a great painter good yeah yeah no the hardest thing about i mean just about everything but you know the, when they don't i you know we all learn this lesson is just how hard you work at something and so for me kind of the base kind of the baseline of all this stuff is okay if you're going to be a professional artist you have to understand how to work and how to uh be disciplined and, and self leverage and sometimes that comes through classes and teaching a community sometimes that can come on your own so it's a very large, you know, kind of question to ask that to me, I try to answer on a very much more individualized level. Mm. Um, I don't, oof, ugh, I don't think everybody should go to school yeah. uh, because no, they don't, they true. don't need to. No, lot um, don't. lot don't. And what's interesting about it is when they get to school, that's when they realize, oh, they might not need this or they get a few classes that they get a good foundation. Oh, I can do this. And they get that drive and inspiration to do that, you know, so everybody's very much an individual to that. But some of the, some of the best stories, you know, from um, from artists that I've always enjoyed, kind of the commonality has been um, kind of a side tangent has been cold climate. So uh, some of my favorite artists always come out of England or they come out of the Midwest and Minnesota and stuff like that. And I think because since it's too cold there, they can't go outside. Yeah. So they just have to sit and paint or do something else all day. So <laughs> I say any aspiring artist move to a cold climate so you can't go outside. Move to New York or Boston. Sunshine. Yeah, yeah. Like move to Flagstaff, just get trapped in snow for a few winters. Shanto's up there. <laughs> yeah. He paints. The, um, you know, it's an interesting field, art. And I wonder at the university or at Pima, do they have any classes that teach the business of art? Because to me, I see most artists don't have a good sense of what this yeah. is all about. Um, we try to, but we're, we don't have, you know, being around art my whole life, I mean, we don't have what we probably should. I mean, we have a lot of mentorship, especially mm. at Pima, like when a student really likes a faculty and they've been taking a lot of class with the faculty, we have those conversations all the time, you know, how to price work, how to sell painting, so forth. Oh, that's good. Um, you know, how to photograph work, how to, you know, market yourself. I and mean, we've got a class to how to, you know, build a website, get your portfolio ready and so forth like that. Um, but having just a very strict business class, no. Yeah. Not many schools do. And that's something that we all desperately need. You know, I mean, that's something we need to really focus in on and, you know, how to, you know, how to do your own taxes, how to understand where to put your money, how to do this. You right. know, even simple things are like, I don't know, investing in stuff, you know, stuff that. Right. 
you know, <laughs> usually we have to stumble in that the hard way. Yeah. And then, uh, probably true for a lot of professions. It, yeah. Even in medicine, when I was in medicine, they didn't teach us any of that. No, Nothing. they didn't. Nothing. Zero. Really? Not a zero. That's mm-hmm. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. No. But the classes you think they should teach us to become better humans, yeah. like, or at least workable functioning humans, yep. they, they kind of avoid nope. in a way. Yeah. And I think it would be good too to have, you, you know, you may want to consider having your students, the ones that are thinking about going into as a profession as, and as an artist, yeah. go visit with dealers in a, you know, no, it's a great idea. Yeah, and yeah. say, okay, what does it really take? Right. How, do, how do I actually get into a gallery like this? Yeah. Well, it's not that easy, actually. Yeah. And I'm not just the only one. No. And yeah. then if I do get into a gallery, what's the responsibilities on my end? Right. And their end? Yeah. And how do I not get ripped off? <laughs> right. Those are wonderful points yeah. and, and stuff that most of us had to find out the hard way. It's true. Artists yeah. get ripped off constantly. Yeah. The best way to find out about a dealer, quite frankly, I think is to go, if you're a, an artist, go ask all the other artists. Oh, right. Find out who is really pays and does what right. they say they're going to do and do all those things. Yeah, that's a wonderful point because, I mean, regardless of how much we don't want to admit it, the art circle is such a tight circle. Mm-hmm. Like, we're a very close family. Whether we know everybody in the family or not, you can soon meet yep. them. Um, yeah, it's it because, it, yeah, you don't want to burn a bridge. You don't want to do anything because everybody will find out. Right. You know. And there's dealers out there who will have no problems just not paying you. Yeah. <laughs> They'll sell the art yeah. and... You know, 60, 90, 100 days go by, whatever, and they haven't paid the artist. Oh, we're waiting to get paid or something. And they're just reusing because they don't have the capital. They're just using And then all of a sudden, they're just gone. Right. And I've seen it happen repetitively. God. You know, and a good question to ask is the question that Howard Post asked me when he first came, when when I was trying to get him to to, to represent him, which was like 27 years ago. And he said to me, he goes, are you going to be around in two years? (laughs) Yeah. It's a fair question. It is. It's actually a really relevant question. Yeah. Yeah. And because he wanted to get a gauge of how serious I was. Right. And, you know. This is when you were first starting. Yeah, first yeah. starting. Yeah. And I think that's a fair question yeah. to ask. I said, yeah, I'm going to be around. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to be around for a hell of a lot longer than two years. <laughs> yeah. He goes, okay, we'll see. Good. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and he was right to ask that question. Yeah, 100% right to you ask know? that question. And um, I think artists should ask those kind of questions. Yeah. The hard part with at Pima specifically um, is that we're only a two-year institution for transfers. Mm-hmm. So like when we get the people that more individually want to be there just for a class or a semester and want to do this, normally they come in, which is nice because they have the, the, uh, you know, the uh, momentum themselves to ask those questions. And so we are very happy to, to answer best that we can. Um, but like... A four-year institution, you know, U of A had something like that when I was there. Mm. Uh, David, bless his heart, did his best in our last uh, uh, senior illustration class to kind of split it up half the time business, half the time, you know, uh, you know, critiques and drawing and painting and went over contracts and went over all those stuff with us, which was nice, give us a nice foundation for it. But, I mean, I haven't been around the U of A in a while. I imagine they'd have something like that there now. Because would hope. Don't I would hope, too. Um, no I mean, one's ever called me. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, we'll get on the phone with you. We'll make, if you're offering, we'll be happy. Yeah. It would be great, yeah, actually. No, I would be. It would be, actually, an awesome thing to do because what is a very sobering experience is understanding the reality of the situation. You know, And I think when people, for instance, you know, I kind of talk on painting, but get into a painting class, for instance, um, it's a little bit of a tangent, but they... They don't realize how much of painting is drawing. Mm-hmm. They don't realize how much of painting is carpentry and construction and chemistry and stuff like that. And so when you open their mind to that, whoa, and that's not even, you know, 50% of the ball game. Then you got to talk about all the stuff we were just talking about and how to market yourself, get your work out there. And it's a very right. daunting task. And there's also health issues you have yeah. to be aware of, you know? Yeah, all you're the inha- safety requirements. And yeah, everything. and you're inhaling yeah. things. Yeah. And, you know, artists die all the time. They do. You know, where it's a... <laughs> Jimenez dying from the sculpture falling on him or, you know, or somebody using their hands and not, you know, wear gloves. All those those uh, drip painters from the the seventies, you know, they just dripped right those cadmiums right into their cuticles and most of them got sick from that stuff. So it's, it's, it's a, you know, but giving a person a foundation and, you know, on my foundation came a lot of just trial and error, Mm -hmm. you know, like most people's. So trying to give everybody a little bit of that head start, but, uh, yeah, no, it's it's an interesting. I, I don't want to make it sound, you know, too negative because it's a lot of wonderful positive comes out of it. It's just a lot of stuff to really focus on. It's like every aspect, other aspect of life. You know, you just have so much stuff you weren't expecting. You're like, oh, I'll just go to get a painting. I'll just take care of itself. Right. Uh, you know, there's 
a little bit more to it. Than that. Well, I think it's good. I think it's good yeah. to have your, um, you know, eyes open to what right. you're, you're walking into if you really want to be an artist. Yeah. Because it's not an easy profession. No, it's not. It really and is And that's not. one of the questions that I try to... It's rewarding. It is. I think it's a wonderful profession. Yeah, very rewarding, you know? but it's not easy. Yeah, get to meet great people and yeah. you know, that you would never expect. Get to go to cities you would never expected. You know, it's it's really neat. Your art gets to be seen by people you would never thought it would have lived or existed. You know, it's it's awesome stuff, you know, when it comes down to it. And you get to create. And you get to create, either selfishly or what. It's yeah. really neat, you know, and then you... Then you can rationalize with all these beautiful uh -huh. artist statements. Everyone thinks you're profound and philosophical. You're like, no, I just want to paint somebody in a clown mask. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what's what's next for you? You've been teaching 15 years. Yeah. You've been showing in two. You're in two galleries, right? Yeah. And uh, so what's next on your horizon? Um, I'm like we were talking about a little bit earlier. I'm finally uh, inspired to start painting. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of paintings in the works right now, and so I'm about to finish a couple of them up, and and uh, you know, get get into got about five shows coming up next year oh my so i've got that's try, a lot it's a few so i'm trying to get a lot of work done for that what's nice they give you that stuff at least a year and a year and a half out so yeah. um but uh you know i'm i'm staying in the figurative realm kind of dancing a little bit more into the landscape um but uh trying to produce as much work as i can because um as probably you know many other artists and and you know you've said so yourself with your writing some of the best uh understanding of where you are and where you're going is just creating that initial momentum and and just getting into it mm -hmm. and i think sometimes the fun which i've really done recently is just starting because that's the hardest thing to do it right? it's it's the hardest thing and and i've been always kind of like oh i don't know what i'm gonna paint i don't know what i'm gonna do i'll just <laughs> i'll just sketch tonight or something like that and i'm like yes ah, just get back in there and so when you get back in there and you start making stuff maybe you don't know what you're doing and i didn't this last time around and then you just start making things and then get the gears going get everything greased up and you know and everything then it starts to take a direction you would have never expected um so to answer your question i'm not really sure where mm -hmm. i'm going right now with my art um you know i probably can see myself teaching for another 10 years mm -hmm. um I don't know how much more past that. So I love teaching, but it is an exhausting process. I would think so. Yeah. It's if a, you're doing it well. I, yeah, I would think. And, and engaged. Yeah, if you're it. engaged and you're in the class and the pulse and you're dealing with everybody's energy, good and bad, I mean, it's an exhausting process. So I'm always like, oh, I'll go home and paint and get all this stuff done. You can sit in front of the easel and just fall asleep against it. Um, that's what makes it a little bit difficult to really put that energy into painting while the semester's going on. It's doable, but it's it's... Um, it does take away from it. And how many paintings can you do in a year yourself? Oh, I think my best year was, uh, you know, like, you know, gallery, larger paintings. I, I think I cranked out eight. Yeah. So that was about one, a, one a month and a half. Yeah. One a month. And so here's exactly what a dealer would say. Yeah. Not enough. Oh, I know. Yeah. They would go, it's, it's key, not, enough. not enough body of work for yeah. us to, you know, it's and, not. Yeah. Um, unless they are extremely expensive and, you know, well, they can Big. if you let me know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to build it. That's yeah, the problem. It is. You know, that's another one of the things that, you know, how do you, uh, work, and I get the smartest all the time. You know, how do I price my work and right. when should we move it up? And, you know, I get artists who've been in the business for 40 years asking me, should we raise our prices? Yeah. You know, and understandably, they are asking me because they're not on the front lines of the of the gallery. They don't hear what people say or, about, right. you know, oh, this is too high, it's too low. And sometimes I tell them, you know, this is, I wouldn't do it at this time. I don't think right. I'm already getting resistance at these levels. You have to be careful. Um, so those are, again, those type of things. And yeah. for somebody like yourself who's doing eight a, a year, you know, yeah, how do you price them? It's tough. Yeah. Um, you know, cause, if you're selling them, then you're pricing them right. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I am selling them, which is nice. And I'm kind of dancing in between my prices where they're accessible for uh, most, but they're starting to get to the point where they're only accessible for a few. Yeah. And I don't know if I want to, I mean, I'd like to dance into the next bracket, but that limits it to just a, you know, a certain clientele, which is nice. Um, so I think because of that, I've been starting to paint a little bit smaller. Uh, you know, paint them a little bit faster, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where I'm going with these things. Plus, secretly, that costs less to ship and and to insure and all. Yeah, that no, stuff. there's all those things and frame and all yeah. those kind of things. And and it, and then more people can you know kind of uh, go about. It. I think it's still the graduate school in me. You know, paint these large objects and these profound yeah. you know sculptures, which is pretty powerful stuff. But yeah, I know, do like that actually. It is cool. Personally, but... I I would prefer. Oh, for me, I'd much me, rather prefer to get bigger paintings. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. But I, I don't think for 
uh, most people that's successful for, you know, putting stuff in their home or, or, you know, what they had in mind for it. And, yep. you know, it seems like almost kind of too daunting, you know, uh, as an investment. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's been an interesting dynamic kind of balancing the two. Um, you know, I think recently I focused more on teaching than I have painting, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, which again, sadly kind of makes me in, in, in many ways, and I hate to admit this over camera, but kind of a worse teacher, you know, because some of your best stuff comes out of the creation. Some of your best mm -hmm. ideas and your best lectures come out of when you're making things, you know, and what's neat is the classroom environment can put you back into that, um, you know, that kind of that discourse of creation, which is really profound and the, that gets you back into painting. So it's kind of symbiotic in a way. Um, maybe but, you share that in one of your classes, you yeah. start a painting or two during the first yeah. of the semester and you share the problems you're having and the oh, yeah. struggles you're having and show them how what and break the illusion of being the amazing <laughs> exactly. teacher actually that's a good idea yeah. you know yeah i think it would ground them to you and yeah. like you know this guy's been doing it for 20 years but he still has to struggle too the same problems yep i mean there's that great book uh you know the um by robert henry the oh now i'm totally blanking yeah i know what the, you mean. Oh, why am i not thinking it? i haven't read it in a while always um but where he goes through his process. Yeah. It's just, it's, well, he was interested in dynamic symmetry. Yeah. And it, it's just it's just fascinating to, you know, and then like a Francis Bacon, the brutality of fat going through his philosophies. and But at the at the, clux, at the, crux, the crux of those things is hearing the artist's struggles. And, you know, when you get to hear the artist in a way, their self-doubt. and oh, That's wait, right. Wait, they're going through exactly the same things That's I'm right. going through? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a nice, I mean, so, yeah, students like it. I like hearing it from other artists that I respect and adore, so... I think all my artists have that problem. Yeah. Well, how time. much, I mean, for I mean, your shop, how many paintings would you expect? An artist to do? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I won't get them all. So, but I think most artists can do 50 paintings in a year. Yeah. You know, and some can do more. Yeah. But, you know, 30 to 50. I mean, I'm having a, a one-man show for Steven Dance. Oh, cool. And he's, uh, we planned it two years in advance. Yeah. And it's going to have six to seven paintings, but they're all going to be, 30 to 40 or bigger. Oh, wow, yeah. You know? And um, I don't know if he'll ever do that again after that. <laughs> I think it, does, it does killing take something him. out of you, yeah. Yeah, I think it's oh. actually, it's you know, it sounded good on, right. on paper. That was Charles's idea again. <laughs> oh, you said Stephen do that. Stephen, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then you go into it and you go, oh, Jesus, I've only finished two and it's, you know, right. a year away. And I, you know. It's... Eyes are always, the ideas are always best on paper. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's really true. But I think, yes. Um, you know, at least 30. Yeah. Um, first of all, you have to make a living as an artist. Yeah. I mean, just do the numbers, right? You know, and um, so that you have to do enough to, to, to make a living. Yeah. Um, and some artists can do way more. And I, I think it's better if you, as an artist, personally, if you, you're not too prolific because there's, there's things that can hurt you in that See, way. See, there you said the magic thing. Yeah. That, uh, you know, you want to produce enough that you're relevant, and yep. you can, but you don't want to produce too much That's that you correct. oversaturate your market. No, so, it's true. I mean, and, and you, not you, only, you'd hit on the head. Yeah. yeah, And not only saturate the market, but the resale market. Right. So when things come, if you, there's too much stuff out there, especially the earlier stuff, and it goes right. into auctions and it's selling for not good money or right. whatever, it may not have been as good at art, but it affects your price. Or if you know, it's critical not to be uh, too prolific, I think. Yeah. So is that kind of an idea? Maybe we you, you make about five or six paintings and fake your own death, and then all of a sudden you. I wrote a book about it. Oh, cool! <laughs> Paint by numbers. Good. Go read about it. I'm yeah. looking to read something. So I'll, I'll pick that up. That's awesome. Be kind of almost kind of a you know come back like how the Rolling Stones always have their final tour. Yeah, you know, no. Just keep doing I've it. I've gone over to and three over. of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there is truth in not doing too much. Right. Yeah. Uh, eight is too little. Eight is way too little. Yeah. yeah. Unless they're huge and, and take time. I mean, there are some artists that can only do like 10 a year and they're yeah. really, but they only will have one gallerist at yeah. most because no gallerist would, you know. It's been tough doing the two. So, I mean, like yeah. mainly I've just had one, uh, you know, it's been, they've been great to me. It's been really nice. Uh, but yeah, that's the question that you've always kind of, well, we could use some more paintings. We could yeah. do this. And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. here's 15 minutes. I'll go over here and do this. <laughs> so it's, it's been an interesting balancing act. So, but I think to answer your, your question from about 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, that's what I would want to focus on when I'm done, you know, done teaching because teaching has provided such a wonderful, um, opportunity for me that I didn't expect that I'd love so much. And I really did and do love it. Mm -hmm. But, kind of that thing that got me into art to begin with and got me into art school without even really knowing about it and kind of an unconscious thing. I got to get back mm -hmm. to just painting full time. 
and I just got to get sit in that studio and live that life of isolation and just create. Yeah. Because I mean, doing it, I think that's, I'll be perfectly, that's kind of been half my problem is just, um, you know, starting and stopping, you know, that, that does not allow for that great no. momentum to be built. No, it interrupts the flow. It does. It's really tough. And, um, you know, that's something that I've talked about with students. They've talked about with me, you know, it's just this interesting kind of dynamic. And I think it's very manageable and a lot of artists do it much better than I do. And they don't complain near as much, which is nice, but, <laughs> um, it, it, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a little bit of a struggle. If I'm being perfectly honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think another thing you should do personally after just interviewing and listening to you, you should do a book on, um, becoming an artist. How do you become an artist from an art, from an art teacher's cool perspective? Yeah. yeah. And give them those, that road, yeah. that roadmap. I don't know if there's much out there. I mean, most kids probably today would rather, um, here at via videotape, but the YouTubers, yeah, yeah, you could do it as that way. You could be a little YouTube yeah. star, um, which is, but a book, I'll probably have nice. to wear a wig if I want to. <laughs> no, no, no. You have to look old. They're not going to believe you. <laughs> oh, otherwise. right. That's true. It'd be an old. Have you done work. any videos like that at all? No, but I've, I've recorded a few recently yeah. and kind of speed time lapse, you know, kind of painting stuff. Cause it's just like, I am terrible at marketing myself and I'm terrible yeah. about thinking, Oh wait, this is, there's something called computers and I can get a part of this thing. Yeah. I think, um, if, if, I don't know if you believe in past lives, but I think, uh, I probably live my, my best life maybe during the Renaissance. Cause that's about the technology level that I understand <laughs> and that I, I don't like, believe that. That I, that I kind of, I kind of feel a part of, um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of on the goal on the horizon. Yeah. I could, I mean, your dad's a writer. Yes. And so Damn good one. Yeah. So, I mean, you, there is something that you can share in that sensibility whether it's writing or, you know. But I, don't I, let them fool you. I write like a police report. It's just yeah. very matter of fact. It's just, you know. Well, they're students. They <laughs> yeah, need that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything, last words you want to oh. say to anybody um, besides go buy my paintings? Oh, no. If, if you want, but don't. No yeah, I do highly encourage people to go to your website. Oh, and thanks. See your yeah. Art. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm basically li listed on there, uh, Michael J. Nolan or michaeljohnnolan.com. Uh, my current shows will be at Lovett's Gallery in Tulsa, Oklahoma oh, next nice. year. Yeah, they've been really good to me, and it's been a lot of fun working with them. So, um, yeah, come take a class. You know, explore. Um, and to be honest with you, I mean, it's it's so fun um, to get that student and to get that person who never thought they could have been an artist, always in the back of their head wanted to try, and then by the end of the semester, they're drawing and painting like they never thought they would do it. Yeah, and it and the hardest part about any of this stuff is just that, um, you know, just getting him not to believe, but to getting to see through the wizardry that the wizardry is just hard work and to give him the process of how to build and get through to that point is, is pretty awesome. I think it's why I adore teaching the beginning classes more so than the, maybe the upper division one sometimes. Yeah. You um, probably can make a bigger difference. I, I, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Let's, I like to think so, at least for my own ego, but, yeah. um, but it's, it's just kind of seeing it and it sounds so silly. A lot of that kind of, there's that trendy phrase, the aha moment, but it's just seeing when somebody tunes on and turns on and just, Oh yeah. It's got, it's gotta be so it's, rewarding. It is. And you know, yeah. we can say all the time we do it for them, but now we're doing it for us. I just yeah. love to see that look on their face. Oh yeah. And, you know, go home, get myself a Cinnabon and go to bed early. It's really fun. <laughs> no, but go paint, go paint. Right. You have a, a show coming up. <laughs> I, I do. can I assure gotta... you the dealer is hoping you're painting. Oh yeah, he is. And I am, I'm painting, I'm painting. Which camera do I look at? But, uh, <laughs> No, thank you for the opportunity. This was a lot yeah, of fun very to good. chat with you. Very casual. Yeah, Michael fun, Nolan. So, it's yeah. wonderful having you on. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for teaching. You make yeah. a difference. Appreciate it. We need teachers out there. We need people that are, you know, promoting art in yeah. all forms and fashions. You clearly are doing it. And you're painting. I think it's important that teachers that are that are, are doing this, they should be painting they or should. sculpting or whatever or yeah. creating, you know, because um, that keeps them grounded to why they did it to begin with. Yeah. I think you said it perfectly. Yeah. I like that. I think to that. It's right. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank we'll you. see you around. Pleasure Michael Nolan. Thank, thank you. you so much. Very good. That was fun. Oh, that was excellent. That was great. So, yeah. You know, I wanted to um, really kind of get a sense of what it is to be a teacher, you know? I haven't had uh, I haven't had a teacher on. I've had people that teach. Right. And we talk about it. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.